Hello, and welcome to the final session of MDIC's annual public forum. During today's session, we will discuss how MDIC is working with various stakeholders, including FDA, industry, academia, and international nonprofit organizations to transform computational modeling and simulation from a valuable scientific tool to a valuable regulatory tool, as well as to develop mechanisms to rely more on digital evidence. Please make sure to join in the conversation on Twitter by following at MDIC Annual Forum and using the hashtag MDICAPF2020. Now, Please welcome session moderator Randy Scheistel, Vice President of R&D Global Technology at Boston Scientific. Welcome to the Medical Device Innovation Consortium Annual Public Forum Session on Computational Modeling and Simulation. This session will be recorded and posted on the MDIC website. Our panelists today will include myself, Randy Scheistel, two representatives from FDA, Dr. Tina Morrison and Dr. Pross. Beth Manathan, Dr. Steve Levine, and Dr. Marcus Reiterer. Let me introduce each of our panelists and provide a short overview of MDIC and our upcoming plans. We will close with a live Q&A segment. Thank you in advance to our panelists for their engagement. I am Randy Schussel and serve as Vice President of Global Technology and Services at Boston Scientific and as board member of both MDIC and Avicenna. Our Modeling and Simulation Center of Excellence at Boston Scientific is part of my organization. Dr. Tina Morrison is Deputy Director, Division of Applied Mechanics in the Office of Science and Engineering Laboratories at FDA. Dr. Morrison chairs the FDA Modeling and Simulation Group. Dr. Pross Path Manathan holds the position of scientist for the Program on Credibility of Computational Models, also in the Office of Science and Engineering Laboratories at FDA. He is co-founder and co-chair of the FDA Modeling and Simulation Working Group. Dr. Stephen Levine is Senior Director for Virtual Heart Modeling and Executive Director of the Living Heart Project at Dassault Systems. He is co-PI of the in silico clinical trial titled Enrichment. Dr. Marcus Reiterer is Distinguished Scientist and Technical Fellow in Strategy and Scientific Operations at Medtronic. Among other responsibility, he's hold, he holds board memberships with Avicenna and Army Biofab. The Medical Device Innovation Consortium at www.mdic.org is the first ever public-private partnership created with the sole objective of advancing medical device regulatory science for patient benefit. Formed in late 2012, MDIC brings together representatives of the FDA, NIH, CMS, industry, nonprofits, and patient organizations to improve the processes for development, assessment, and review of new medical technologies by collaborating in the pre-competitive space. There are several platforms within MDIC, including data science and technology, clinical science, case for quality, health economics and patient access, and NEST, the National Evaluation System for Health Technology Coordinating Center. Our session today is focused on the Data Science and Technology Program at MDIC. Data Science and Technology includes external evidence methods, computation modeling and simulation, cybersecurity, as well as several other emerging projects, such as augmented uh, virtual reality, 5G network planning, diagnostics, and others. Evid external evidence methods has become a broad phrase and schematic used to visually capture multiple sources of external data, and information that been, can be accumulated to drive deep analysis and assessment. Real-world data, real-world evidence, and clinical data, and the use of computation modeling and simulation creates a broad spectrum of potential data sources. MDIC will conduct a survey on computational modeling and simulation in the upcoming months. The purpose of the survey is to gather input to refresh our five-year strategic roadmap for computation modeling and simulation. This program is built on the foundation of validation requirements demonstrating regulatory grade simulation results. The resulting roadmap will chart the course to realize computation modeling, vision of quick and predictable access to innovative technologies enabled by modeling and simulation evidence. 
advancing patient care continues to be our primary motivation. In addition, MDIC is partnering with FDA in pursuit of our common goal to establish top 10 considerations for good simulation practices. Through this survey, we hope to gather stakeholder feedback to capture best practices and guide the use of modeling and simulation in health technologies. Survey results will support an ongoing discussion at MDIC regarding the five-year strategic plan for modeling and simulation at MDIC. As done with the prior survey, compiled data will be published and disseminated through multiple forums. As we begin the survey, we will collect some basic participant information. However, all responses will be anonymous. Some may find themselves in the final category of awareness, but not yet developing computational capabilities or tools. Others may be experts in the field. We all face obstacles in our daily work and knowing which constraints impact our industry most will help us to put an action plan in place for continuous improvement. The obstacles we identified in the prior survey more than five years ago are likely not the same as those we face today. Certainly global regulatory acceptance of modeling data is much more open and is fast becoming an expe expectation on submissions for device approval. We all measure success somewhat differently and therefore we need to understand the various perspectives companies and agencies take as they assess value. All are interested in improved device quality and performance as well as speed to market. Let us know how you measure success to drive further adoption of modeling and simulation. Our global computation modeling and simulation community has made strong progress in recent years to advance the science and adoption of modeling and simulation. Regulators are on board and in fact pushing for increased use of modeling and simulation to bring new technology and devices to market with safety, effectiveness, and speed. Benefits have resulted on multiple fronts from design to approval, full-scale manufacturability, and long-term sustainability. Moving forward, the opportunity for additional research and implementation of computation modeling and simulation is unlimited. One day we will do more modeling than testing or trials in our industry, leading to further benefits for our clinicians, physicians, and patients. Thank you for joining today's session. Next, you will hear from Dr. Tina Morrison, FDA. Thank you, Randy, for the introduction. We are excited to introduce you all to CDRH's new program on the Credibility Assessment of Computational Modeling Regulatory Science Program. At CDRH, patients are at the heart of what we do. We aim to give patients in the U.S. access to high-quality, safe and effective medical devices of public health importance first in the world. This vision drives the work that we do. In fact, over the last five years or so, CDRH has been extraordinarily busy implementing initiatives to help achieve our vision of a patient-centered total product lifecycle approach where we can optimize the benefit-risk trade-offs for patients. As you can see on the slide, there are several programs underway. Those include an emphasis on evidence generation, which includes data generation from modeling and simulation, developing methodologies for pre- and post-market balance decision-making, and importantly, the science of patient input, many of which Randy mentioned during his introductory remarks. Of particular relevance are the digital health and pre-certification program, which has really helped to shape our thinking around a possible future state for how we at CDRH evaluate medical devices. The pre-certification program has established appraisal metrics to help assess software as a medical device, including those with modeling and simulation, to offer more flexibility, timely and efficient review based and driven by quality. The case for quality program, which is being led by CDRH and is also an MDIC work stream, this program is intended to help the FDA identify device manufacturers that consistently produce high quality medical devices. CDRH has been encouraging the implementation of quality in all aspects of the total product life cycle. And we are heeding our own encouragement over the last 18 months, CDRH has undergone a massive reorganization where we've changed the structure of CDRH, but not our important regulatory function. The new structure is based on the total product lifecycle evaluation, and our staff are no longer siloed between pre-market and post-market evaluation. Along those lines, we've been embracing digital transformation. We are considering important ways that we can harness technology to do our jobs more robustly, 
more efficiently, and more expeditiously. So take for a moment the concept of a digitally integrated total product lifecycle model. The idea here is that we'd have continuous visibility and insight into the manufacturer, the product, and industry performance. And this would allow for real-time characterization of product failure modes and risks using real-world performance data. And we can, have, we can assess active relevant risks by monitoring performance changes. We can shift the FDA engagement earlier in the lifecycle process to improve design quality and have visibility in other parts of the ecosystem as compared to our current state today where most of our engagement is at the end when manufacturers are ready to enter the market. With that, imagine a data-driven FDA oversight. I hope many of you have seen the Iron Man films where with Jarvis, the smart computer that helps the Iron Man have access to all the information that he needs at any given time to make important life-saving decisions. Imagine how these tools like modeling and simulation could enhance the review process and the review experience throughout the total product life cycle. One in which we say goodbye to PDFs and thumb drives and move to a system where data can be analyzed and reviewed, where real world performance can drive relevant and better insights into product characterization. This is the future we're aiming for and simulation is gonna be a key part of this future, the future state for CDRH and the medical device ecosystem. But how are we gonna get there is one of the key aspects of the computational modeling work stream, alongside the other important work streams that you've already heard about. And we're demonstrating this through a CDRH critical path project called the Enrichment Project, where we intend to demonstrate the different facets of data-driven FDA oversight I've just described, along with using computational model and the development of in silico clinical trials to impact device evaluation and device performance review. You'll hear more about that project from Steve Levine at the end of this presentation. And what will help support the implementation of this is CDRH's credibility assessment of computational modeling regulatory science program. We recognize there is not a one size fits all approach for modeling and simulation applications. So we've geared our thinking towards the good simulation practices, as you, as you heard Randy mention. And we're thinking about appraisal metrics now for how we can evaluate the use of simulation in a myriad of possibilities that I've just described and that you'll hear more about. So to tell you more about that program is the program coordinator, Dr. Pras Patmanathan. Thank you, Tina. And um, thank you, MDIC, for this invitation to talk about the credibility of computational models program at OCEL, OCEL being the Office of Science and Engineering Laboratories, the, the research arm of CDRH. So as an introduction, let's think about how, how um, the traditional types of evidence that have been used in regulatory submissions um, for medical devices, typically bench testing, data, animal testing, clinical trials, um, and Recently, in the last few decades, computational um, model generated evidence has been, has been used to test devices virtually. But the, the use of computational modeling is more than just modeling the device. Now there's various different ways that computational models are used in medical device applications. And this try, slide tries to kind of overview the different approaches that can be taken. So on one hand, it's possible to model just the device um, and that can be used to, to do virtual testing of a device and reduce or eliminate benchtop testing. But it's also possible to model per patients and therefore it's possible to model um, how a virtual device interacts in virtual patients and that can be used to improve the type of testing that can be done um, in simulation. The third application area is where the patient is modeled, only the patient is modeled. And that is where the model actually is part of a device or is the device itself, such as software, as a medical device. So in this case, the, the model is not of uh, a patient that's of, of a subject that's generated by academia. The model is of, a, um, of you. There's a fundamental question here. When can the models be trusted? That's a, a question that's highly relevant to, to CDRH, and it's something that we've been thinking about for a while. So OCEL has been a leader in this emerging field of credibility of computational modeling for medical devices in the last 10 years. Credibility is defined as the trust 
based on all available evidence in the predictive capability of a computational model. So basically how reliable is a computational model? This is uh, clearly a, a crucial question that needs to be addressed and we need best practices and methods and tools for addressing this question, both for industry for demonstrating the credibility of their computational models and for FDA for evaluating that evidence. So OCEL scientists have collaborated with scientists across industry um, on the, the development of the ASME BNB40 standard. That's a standard that came out in 2018. It's the first standard that covers the credibility of computational for modeling for medical devices um, across the scope of all types of modeling that can be done for medical devices. And, and that was a, a really major milestone for the community, I believe, two years ago. OCEL has also been um, publishing the results of research science related to credibility of computational models. We've done research projects related to validation of specific models, uncertainty quantification, developing general assessment frameworks and tools and best practices. And it's exciting that our research has now been formalized into um, a regulatory science program. So OCEL is in the process over this last year of transitioning to about 20 or so formal regulatory science programs across a wide range of um, areas. And you can see some of these, some of these listed on this slide, things like artificial intelligence, human device interaction, AR, VR, nanotechnology, patient monitoring, post-market, lots of major areas of importance right now. And credibility of computational modeling is one of our, of our programs. So the first thing that we did in the development of this program is to try and identify current credibility related regulatory gaps that are inhibiting the use of modeling and simulation right now in medical device regulatory submissions. So these were developed through internal conversations um, that we also drew from the CDRH regulatory science priorities document for 2020, which is a public document. And that includes uh, an entire section on how modeling and simulation, advancing modeling and simulation is a regulatory science priority for CDRH. I've listed some of the gaps on the right-hand side, just to briefly talk about a few of them. Um, unknown or low credibility of existing models, certainly unknown credibility of existing models is one of the gaps. And these gaps are meant to um, provide uh, motivation for the, for the goals that I'll talk about, for the program goals that I'll talk about in the next few slides. Um, one of the gaps is lack of established good simulation practice or best practices. And um, Marcus Reiter will talk more about the community's effort to start to develop good simulation practices later on in this session. Um, we need more credibility exam assessment examples so that everyone has examples that they can follow and um, there's some kind of uniformity in how credibility is demonstrated. We have this fundamental subjective final assessment that needs to be made at the end. So we need more guidance on how, how that can be done. And um, there's a lack of information on how modeling and simulation is used in regulatory sub submissions at the moment, which I'll talk about uh, momentarily. So we have four high level program goals um, and some more specific goals that I'm not going to talk about. I'm only going to talk about these high level goals and we're currently developing the, the this is all still in, in development. So this is the, one of the first few times that these this goals of this program have been uh, presented. The first goal is the development of cross-cutting credibility assessment frameworks, standards, and guidances. So products that are, re are relevant to multiple modeling disciplines and multiple clinical specialties. One thing that we're trying to do is, one thing that we are doing right now is developing guidance on the use of BNB40 in regulatory submissions. Um, this will be a kind of sister document to the BNB40 standard and will hopefully be um, available for public comment sometime in the nearest future and will provide guidance on how to use the BNB40 standard in the different types of regulatory submissions um, across the different application areas for medical devices that I, that I mentioned earlier on. Another part of this goal is to do scientific research proposing, demonstrating or evaluating assessment frameworks and that research will um, can be used in um, the development of things like future guidances and standards covering more advanced topics such as in silico clinical trials because this is a, a, an evolving area um, 
also perhaps in the revision of the VMB40 standard and the development of good simulation practices, which will be um, something that's going to be continually worked on, hopefully over the next five to 10 years. The second high level program goal is uh, performing and supporting domain specific research related to credibility of computational models. So this is research that's specific to either a modeling discipline or a clinical specialty or, or a particular type of device. So for example, um, research related to the credibility of solid mechanics models that are used to um, predict fracture risk for an implantable device or research related to the credibility of fluid flow models, computational fluid dynamics models that are used to model blood flow or research related to the credibility of electromagnetic models that are used to um, evaluate or used to generate evidence for MR safety of implantable devices and also increasingly credibility of physiological modeling, such as models of the heart. The third application area, the third high level goal is tracking training and formalizing interaction with our regulatory officers. Um, so for example, one goal here is better tracking of how modeling and simulation is used in all the regulatory submissions that we, that we receive. We obviously have all that data, but identifying what types of models are used, where it's used, what type of evidence is provided, what type of information the modeling and simulation results in the submission um, were used in the final regulatory decision is um, not a trivial task and we want to identify better how much modeling and simulation is used in these regulatory submissions. We want to increase, we want to introduce formal training between the, the experts on modeling and simulation in OCEL, our um, research office and the, uh, the regulatory folks in the, in the regulatory offices and um, yeah, introduce training that on, on the credit, on credibility assessment of computational models. Finally, I wanted to finish with one slide that talks about one project that we have ongoing, a mock, a mock submission project um, to initiate a clinical trial using modeling simulation. This is a collaborative project between industry, academia, and FDA. Some of the collaborators are listed at the bottom. The objective is to provide an end-to-end -end example of using modeling and simulation in a medical device regulatory submission. The device that was chosen was an inferior vena cava filter, a device for basically tra trapping blood clots before they reach the lungs. And yet the goal of this project is to replace the traditional bench testing that is done for these types of devices with simulation evidence and to submit an IDE, an investigational device exemption uh, regulatory submission, uh, the type of regulatory submission that is made before starting a clinical trial. So there's two teams, a sponsor team and a review team. And the sponsor team are, are working to generate simulation results and experimental data to validate the simulations um, to answer two questions. One question related to safety, um, where they'll address the fracture risk of the device, and one question related to effectiveness, where they'll evaluate um, where they're doing simulation, re fluid simulation results. Um, and they will use this evidence to submit a mock IDE submission. And then the, the second team, the FDA review team, which is completely blinded to um, the other work that's being done, will independently evaluate the evidence that's submitted and provide their feedback. And all the results of the, all the documents and software tools will be made available uh, publicly so that industry has this valuable resource on, on the entire end-to-end -end process of using modeling and simulation in an IDE submission. Okay, thank you for your attention. I look forward to hearing questions about the credibility of modeling uh, program later on. And I'd, like, I'd now like to pass it on to Steve Levine, who will talk about the Living Heart Project and the Enrichment Trial Project. Thanks, Praz. Uh, my name is Steve Levine, and I lead the virtual human modeling at Deso Systems. I want to thank Randy and the team at MDIC for hosting this event and allowing me to participate. Those of you who know me understand that I like to assess where we are by considering where we've been and where we're going. So today, I'll take the next few minutes to share the history and status of the Living Heart Project and our latest challenge advancing the use of digital evidence through the enrichment in silico clinical trial. We're here to talk about good simulation practice in medical devices. 
and we draw inspiration from other industries where good simulation practice has been well established thanks to their ability to capture the physical phenomenon and develop robust simulation models that they can rely on to design cars and planes and know how they'll perform even before ever building them. Ultimately, they still test them, but rarely are they surprised with the results. We know that understanding of real world phenomenon is not limited to man-made machines. We also have advanced biological capabilities, uh, such as what I'm showing here, the Nobel Prize winning molecular dynamics program. And it begs the question, what's the reason we're far behind uh, adopting these tools for the development and testing of medical devices. So we asked the question, what is it that's holding us back? Is it the limits of technology or maybe we just don't understand, for example, the human heart well enough to simulate it or maybe it's the result of the complex history of the field. If you think about the massive amount of research and clinical data that's collected on the human heart, it's spread out all over all of these different organizations, in research, engineering, uh, clinical practitioners who understand the behavior, and of course, the regulatory agencies. So the idea behind the Living Heart Project was to see if we could bring all these people together to work on the same representation of the human heart, to see if we knew enough, if we assembled all the pieces together, do we knew enough to actually simulate a human heart? So we set out to build a complete multi-scale, multi multi-physics model of the heart, we began with the organ level to build an entire human heart, assembling representatives from all four of these communities, researchers, experts from uh, the clinical field, the medical device industry, and of course, uh, fortunate to have the FDA and the MDIC join from the start. And very quickly, we found that actually when we put together the pieces that we all knew, uh, the expertise that we had in our domains, we actually had the ability to model the entire human heart. So now the living heart is actually a complete multi-physics model. In fact, it's two models, an electrical model that models the electrical system of the heart, uh, coupled to a physical model of the, of the structural response. So you can introduce, for example, electrical abnormalities such as heart block or arrhythmias, uh, and then you can see the response on the muscle tissue, you can see the blood flow referring to it. Uh, and then of course you can introduce disease and then design uh, tools, devices to actually cure those diseases, optimizing them inside a complete human heart, understanding the impact, not just on the local area that's, that your device is affecting, but the entire system that the heart behaves in. Um, and that really is essential to being understanding the full device performance. Unfortunately, I don't have time today to describe the dozens of use cases the Living Heart members have developed uh, over the past five years. But the amazing thing about it is all of these different applications across all of the different domains that uh, you might be of interest in all begin with the same reference heart model. They've been able to adapt that model to reflect the specific disease or a specific patient of interest and then share those results back with everyone else in the project. Uh, and not just share them conceptually, but actually specifically so that that information uh, is immediately usable. So if someone is, for example, doing a uh, very focused test on, say, a valve, uh, that can be tested by another member to see if it works appropriately under their electrical system defect. Uh, in this way, the results make the model much more mature, more quickly, and with each test, it brings us closer to a true reflection of the real world. And we hope over time, it just keeps keep it getting closer and closer. In fact, the Living Heart community uh, now having, instead of just a piece of the puzzle, having an entire human model, human heart model out of the box, have been able to extend the model for drug interactions, 3D printing, training, use for artificial intelligence. Uh, we encourage our members where you can see the growth over time over the past five years. Uh, the team has really grown steadily over time. Uh, we're very fortunate uh, to have an open project so the data is shared throughout the world. We're in 24 countries now. Uh, we encourage people to publish. Here you see uh, a list of some of the publications and this is all available on our website uh, with some videos, etc. Uh, on 3ds.com slash hard. I encourage you to go check it out to learn more. 
Now, the first regulatory work we actually started was back in 2015 uh, when we were approached by the Association of Advancement for Medical Instrumentation, uh, Instrumentation Amy, uh, who were working on trying to devise a suitable clinical trial to measure the intracardial forces to establish a standard for durability of leads placed inside the heart. So we took our living heart and we developed an automatic workflow so each company that was participating could insert their leads into the heart and then report back in a common format. We could then take that procedure, run an in silico clinical trial to determine all the factors that would impact the lead fracture and identify exactly what would happen. We could take those results, identify them numerically. We could share them so clinicians, for example, could look and use things like virtual reality to understand the effect of curvature and lead, uh, and lead placement on the actual results. And that allowed them to uh, reduce the clinical trial. I later learned that this is a process called enrichment, uh, established technique adopt, accepted by the FDA to increase the study power by reducing the population to either a high risk group or likely responders. And this is a effective way of ensuring higher likelihood of success, uh, but it does come with some limitations. Uh, for example, by narrowing the population to increase your chance of success, you often have to minimize the indications, which ultimately results in a reduced patient benefit and of course, reduced market opportunity for the final product. So we wondered, uh, could we enrich a trial using virtual patients and thereby determining the maximum population uh, possible and therefore maximizing the indications and still increasing the chance of success. So we got together with our colleagues at the FDA to attempt to redefine the enrichment paradigm using virtual patients derived from the living heart in an in silico clinical trial. With this approach, we can include the entire breadth of potential patients, i.e. virtually, maximizing the indications and trial power, uh, but still minimizing the actual clinical trial population and risk of failure and cost. Uh, you saw that Iron Man symbol, uh, as Tina, my co-PI in the project mentioned, uh, we're actually inspired by the center director, uh, Jeff Shuren, uh, who uh, you see here uh, was helped with, instrumental in helping us formulate the project. Uh, he made his opinion very clear, uh, his expectations of the project, uh, when he said at, his kick, at the kickoff, uh, the way we do business is kind of out of date, it's time to change, and it's time to change the world. So with that inspiration, uh, we've been pretty busy. Uh, we formed three advisory councils, we've outlined six execution teams, uh, also a communications body partnering with the MDIC, and also leveraging the 140 members uh, of 140 organizations in the Living Heart Project. And ultimately, we'll deliver a playbook outlining everything we've learned and the best practice that we think companies can use to have this new regulatory process of the future. To ensure our work has a high industrial impact, uh, we decided to focus on the mitral valve repair device. Uh, it's a massive technical challenge requiring high quality parametric mitral valve models that can represent not just the disease, but an entire population in sufficient accuracy, hopefully uh, to be accepted by the regulatory review group uh, as digital evidence in place as surrogates for actual clinical evidence. Uh, we, we have a 50 person subgroup, the Living Heart Project, uh, has been very beneficial and they'll help us build that model. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Marcus Reiterer and he'll share his work that he's been doing with our peers in Europe and with the Avicenna Alliance. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Steve, for your words. And uh, now I'm taking over for the last presentation of today. Uh, I'm Marcus Reiterer. I work as a distinguished scientist at Medtronic, and today I'm representing the Avicenna Alliance. Um, I've been a, a member of the board since its inception about five years ago, and I've also been leading the international working group. 
The Avicenna Alliance is a global organization that brings together healthcare stakeholders of all different kinds. With the goal of making uh, in silico medicine standard uh, in practice in healthcare, and uh, we are looking at medical devices, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, and clinical practice in general. Through a collaborative ecosystem with patients, clinicians, academics, industry representatives, policymakers, and regulators and payers, we are trying to advance the acceptance of in silico evidence uh, in the clinical practice, but also uh, in the um, regulatory approval process. The Avicenna Alliance was uh, founded uh, by the request of the European Commission to establish a partnership between healthcare industries and uh, researchers. Uh, the Alliance has its origin in the Virtual Physiological Human Initiative, uh, which is a center of uh, excellence in the research on computer modeling and simulation applied to healthcare and human physiology. And the second origin of the Alliance is the Avicenna project, uh, which developed uh, a roadmap for in silico medicine. And uh, the key objective of the Alliance is addressing uh, barriers for the global adoption of computational regulatory evidence and also to overcome these barriers. In order to successfully use uh, computer modeling uh, as regulatory evidence, you primarily need two things. You need a legal framework that allows you to use computational evidence, such as the 21st Century Cures Act uh, in the United States. And you need a meaningful and agreed upon guidance for model credibility assessment. And that's the reason why we are interested in the development of good simulation practice. And what's special about the Avicenna Alliance is that it uh, combines both the drug and the medical device industries. And the goal of the document is also to develop a uh, good simulation practice that addresses both drugs and medical devices. I would like to mention here uh, Luca Emili, who is the CEO of Insilico Trials Technologies, who is the chair of the Avicenna uh, GSP task force, and he is coordinating our activities. Let me take a moment to talk about the motivation. Why are we doing this? A clinical trial is designed following good clinical practice standard. But how do we design in silico trials? Progress towards formal adoption of computer modeling and simulation for regulatory approval in recent years was made. And many crucial documents have been published. Although many uh, are extremely interested there are still a couple of open questions uh, which lead to uncertainty about the uh, potential benefits. People are uh, unsure about applicable reference documents and they don't know who to contact uh, if they have an issue. Um, this is specifically true for non-FDA related submissions. In the FDA, it's, it's more mature than in, in other uh, regions of the world. So consequently, uh, many companies, both small and large, are reluctant to adopt computer modeling and simulation for regulatory approvals. And we think that uh, with the generation and the publication of uh, good clinical practice uh, standard, uh, we can overcome that barrier, reduce the uncertainty, and uh, that will lead to a greater adoption of the technology. So let me introduce the, the fundamental concept first. And that concept was developed by uh, Marco Vicciconti, who is a well-known figure in the world of uh, in silico medicine. He was the director of the VPH Institute in the past and also uh, led the Avicenna Roadmap project. So he said that a good simulation practice is defined as a standard for design, conduct, performance, monitoring, auditing, recording, analysis, and reporting of in silico studies aimed to reduce, refine, or replace in vitro animal or human experimentation. And that fairly short statement, this one sentence, uh, gives us enough guidance to start uh, with, uh, with the next phase uh, in, in the project. Let me introduce the uh, activities of the Avicenna Alliance uh, to date. So we have created a task force that leads the document generation. We have uh, 54 participants from the Avicenna Alliance uh, company members and from uh, the VPH Institute members for consensus formation. And this consensus formation 
takes place uh, on a, a community that's called in silico world and and then we use a, a slack platform to have our dialogue and you see uh, the information about in silico world uh, a community of practice and the link uh, on the picture in the right this is a uh, invitation only community but uh, everybody who is uh, a practitioner or a stakeholder or a person of interest can join the community. So far we have uh, drafted a context of use taxonomy document and uh, the draft of the index for the good simulation practice document. And we had some initial engagement with regulators on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean and uh, we had several discussions with other organizations uh, like notified bodies, um, patient advocacy group, uh, policy makers in, in the European Union, and, and so on. So these are the two documents that uh, I have uh, already introduced. So the one is uh, the context of use taxonomy, and you see just the first page of that um, printed here as, as an illustration. And uh, it's really important to have a, a conversation about taxonomy at the beginning of such a pro uh, project where many co-authors together will develop a, a document that uh, needs to reflect uh, all of the opinions accurately and it has been proven that it's it's very difficult to write such a document and it takes a lot of time especially when the people who work on the project have very different backgrounds and don't use the same language that's why we thought we work first on this uh, context of use taxonomy to establish a level playing field uh, so that we then can uh, discuss with a common understanding what should be in the good simulation practice standard and how do we formulate it in detail. On the right you see um, the uh, structure laid out uh, with the typical um, items you would expect uh, in, in such a document. How uh, important the topic is and how current uh, can be demonstrated here with this uh, news publication from the European Economic and Social uh, Committee uh, that calls for a good simulation practice document uh, in July 2020. So they basically say that in the light of uh, vaccine development um, in the European Union and the interest of speeding up clinical trials, we need to look at alternative forms of evidence. And that's where modeling and simulation comes in very handy because modeling and simulation or digital evidence in general is the only way how you can accelerate uh, physiology. We cannot cut in the time in animal trials or human clinical trials because it's determined by how quickly a physiology happens. And here in this document, uh, EESC specifically calls out uh, that uh, good simulation practices shall be established in order to deal uh, with uh, real time data. So uh, what we have we done uh, so far? So we are only at the beginning uh, of the work and the work uh, needs to be continued. So let me summarize here the, uh, the major points. The physiological clock cannot be accelerated, but uh, computer modeling and simulation allows to do that. So if we want to accelerate um, innovation in the space of uh, medical devices, vaccines and pharmaceuticals. The most effective way of doing that is by relying on computer modeling and simulation. But in order to do that, we need to have a good and stable framework. And good simulation practice can serve as that. Done right, uh, GSP can foster the acceleration of healthcare product innovation while ensuring safety and efficacy. But if we put this GS this GSP document together, we need to learn from other high reliability industries that are a lot more mature in the use of computer modeling and simulation. And I would like to mention here um, the automotive industry, the aerospace industry, and the, the nuclear industry. Um, they all are highly regulated and have a long history in using uh, computer models, let's say for crash tests or uh, reliability assessments for nuclear power plants. To get the GSP right, we need to conduct a rigorous and multi-stakeholder voice of customer to gain broad consensus. And this is really important to uh, 
ensure that we have effective and meaningful regulation at the end of the day. And uh, what is particularly difficult here is to find the right balance between rigor and practicality. And we should never uh, forget that most other forms of evidence that we collect are also models of reality with its restrictions. Computer modeling and simulation has one set of restrictions. The bench top tests, animal trials, and clinical trials have other set of restrictions. And I think if we combine all the different forms of evidence, we can uh, provide the best healthcare in a reasonable time frame to the patients who are uh, needing the care. So finally, I'd like to invite experts and stakeholders to participate on, in Silico World in our consensus uh, process. So that concludes the uh, presentations for today, and we'll continue with our Q&A session. And you can submit uh, questions to the Q&A by pressing the Q&A icon on, on your screen. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us this summer for MDIC's annual public forum. This concludes our virtual series. Visit apf.mdic.org to revisit the entire series.